8 to 10 degrees, Sophie. Louise, thank you. And that is it from us. It is time now for the news where you are. Goodbye. Thanks, Sophie. Hello, you're watching Wales Today. I'm Nick Savini. 16-year-old Kayleigh Titford died in squalid conditions at home after becoming morbidly obese. Her father is found guilty of causing her death. The conditions in which Kayleigh was found were abhorrent and indicated shocking neglect over a prolonged period of time, both environmentally and physically. A review into Kayleigh's death will look at whether opportunities to help her earlier were missed. Also tonight, the impact of the devastating earthquake on the Turkish and Syrian people living here in Wales as fundraising efforts gather pace. From funding the NHS to spending on council services and schools, how £20 billion is going to be spent by the Welsh Government. He's been at the heart of Wales's recent success, reaching major tournaments. Joe Allen announces his retirement from international football. And looking to earn their spurs, 5,000 Wrexham fans head to Sheffield United in the FA Cup tonight to try to set up a tie against Tottenham. What's it going to take to make you feel like a home match tonight? All the crowd getting behind them, isn't it? Definitely. Yeah. Hopefully drown the Sheffield United fans out. That's our aim. Good evening. The details of the decline and the death of Kayleigh Titford have been truly shocking. The 16-year-old died in filthy conditions at her home in Newtown, covered in infected sores and weighing more than 22 stone. Today, her father, Alan Titford, was found guilty of manslaughter through gross negligence by allowing her to become morbidly obese. Police say it was so harrowing the officers who first dealt with the case have not been able to put it out of their minds. Matthew Richards is at Mould Crown Court for us. Matt. Nick, the same words have come up again and again throughout this case. Horrific, horrendous and inhumane. Those were descriptions from the emergency workers who attended Kayleigh Titford's house in October 2020 after the discovery of her body. Well, first her mother and then her father have now been convicted of manslaughter for allowing her to wither away in dreadful conditions. A review into her death is now underway and surely questions will be asked about how she was kept out of sight of the authorities for so long. And just a word of warning, you may find some of the details in this report distressing. Leaving court this afternoon, convicted of the manslaughter of his own child, Alan Titford must now await his sentence next month for the neglect that ended in her death. This police body camera footage shows Kayleigh Titford's heavily soiled bed in a room cluttered with junk. Remnants of her recent birthday party sit alongside a fly trap covered in insects. Okay, so just okay, let's be breathing. Hello. And are you able to wake her? Kayleigh. Hello. OK, stay on the line and I'll tell you exactly what yeah. to do next, OK? A distressed Alan Titford on the phone to the ambulance service after finding his 16-year-old daughter dead in the bed she'd barely left in months. This was Kayleigh as her school friends remembered her. Strong-willed and quietly determined, she had spina bifida and other health conditions and was a skilled wheelchair basketball player. I'd like to remember the, the, the cheeky smile. Um, you know, the, uh, the wind-up part of it. Uh, the determination and uh, the inner strength she had. But when schools closed in March 2020, Kayleigh stayed at home, becoming increasingly overweight, developing numerous sores which became infected and led to her death. Alan Titford said he left all of her care to his partner, Sarah Lloyd-Jones. Now both have been convicted of manslaughter. The circumstances of Kayleigh's death are tragic. This investigation has been extensive and at times harrowing given Kayleigh's age and the conditions in which she was living. Yet my officers and partners have worked diligently and professionally throughout. The grim circumstances of how Kayleigh Titford lived and died have been explained in forensic detail in court, but there are still many unanswered questions, in particular how a previously active and independent teenager could have become increasingly isolated and then left to die here at home.
Alan Titford and Sarah Lloyd-Jones were ultimately responsible for the shocking conditions that Kayleigh was left in. Maggots were even found in her bedding. But were chances to help her earlier missed due to the Covid lockdown? If the um, social services department were involved with the family, it would have been very challenging for them to go and see the family on a regular basis like they would in a non-Covid non time, really. Kayleigh should have returned to Newtown High School in September 2020, but remained at home. Her mother repeatedly told staff she would soon be back in lessons, but the teenager died that October. But Sarah Lloyd-Jones also told staff she was struggling because she was employed as a carer. In a statement, Powys County Council said a concise child practice review is to be carried out and would involve all relevant agencies. Sally Holland was Children's Commissioner for Wales until last year. Teachers and uh, uh, learning support assistants come to know the children, they have relationships with them, they can spot when things aren't going well at home and children have someone to talk to in school as well. So our schools do much more um, than just educate and uh, we all knew it was a, a, a risk closing the schools, um, but it was a balance of risks at the time. Alan Titford told the court he was as much to blame for Kayleigh's death as her mother because he was lazy. This child protection expert says this is reflected in similar neglect cases where parents don't have even the basic skills to care for their children. Parents that don't get their children the vaccinations that they need, parents that don't take for eye checks, hearing checks, parents that don't get their teeth done, give them the wrong food. Don't, the diet is rubbish, turning up in dirty clothes to, at school and starving, yet, yet they love their parent and the parents love them, but there just isn't that ability to parent. The authorities hope to learn what, if any, steps could have been taken to prevent Kayleigh Titford's death, but her life was cut tragically short by the criminal neglect of the two people who should have cared for her the most. Well, the jury had to listen to such difficult evidence that today, when he was dismissing them, the judge directed them towards counselling and support services if they, feel, if they felt they needed to talk to someone. Also today, the NSPCC Cymru has said that although uh, Kayleigh's parents were responsible for her death, uh, this, it shows the importance of having safeguarding in place so that uh, other neglected children's suffering doesn't go unnoticed. Well, uh, Alan Titford and Sarah Lloyd-Jones will both be sentenced early next month. Nick. Thanks, Matt. Matthew Richards at Mole Crown Court there. Syrian and Turkish people living in Wales have been speaking of their heartbreak and deep concerns for relatives caught up in the devastating earthquakes. Fundraising efforts have already got underway. Meanwhile, the leader of a specialist rescue team based in North Wales has spoken of his frustration at not being able to take a team into northern Syria because of the continuing civil war there. Here's Colette Hume. International search and rescue dog teams arriving in southern Turkey. But a specialist search unit based in Llanvairvecan near Bangor say they've been told they can't go to Syria because the political situation there means it's too dangerous. Every little helps. They're trying to get people out alive. Um, but they're looking at a big area. Our dogs can bring that area down to a small area. This is the Syrian city of Aleppo, reduced to ruins first by years of war and now this natural disaster. It's also the hometown of Cardiff doctor Mohammed al Haj Ali. It's really very catastrophic. They need medical aid, they need shelters and also they need lots of help and support to try to get people out the ruins. Um, I mean, that, that's the highest priority, to be honest with you. Millions of people across southern Turkey and northern Syria have been affected by this, the biggest earthquake in the region for decades. Feliz Celik is from Turkey. She now lives and works in Swansea. She set up an online fundraiser to help her fellow countrymen. We're talking about a very vast area, uh, at least 10 city centres and surrounding areas. So it's all coming back to you that you have family in those other cities, you have friends in those other cities, whether you know they're safe or not, and your friends' families, whether they're safe or not. In the Senate this afternoon, politicians paused. And our thoughts as a Senate are with the people of that region as they seek to rescue, to survive and to grieve. Turkey has appealed to the international community for help. Some rescue teams have arrived and more are on the way. But the sheer size and scale of this disaster means those teams will face difficult decisions 
about where to go and who to help. The reality is that some of those isolated communities may see nobody for a week, 10 days. Um, because to send a helicopter or a rescue party to that village almost by necessity means that another village isn't being attended to. While the rescue effort continues, tonight here in Wales, families and friends wait and hope. How £20 billion is going to be spent on public services in Wales has been debated at the Senedd. Welsh government ministers have been defending a decision in their draft budget not to raise more money for the NHS by putting up income tax. They say a tax hike would hurt workers who are already relying on food banks. But Plaid Cymru says without extra funding, the NHS will buckle. Well, let's take a look at how the draft budget has been divided up. The larger section here on blue, in blue on this graph, health and social care, which of course includes the budget for the NHS, nearly accounting for half of the entire budget, more than £10.7 billion. Then we have the cash going to local authorities, and more than £5 billion in orange there in total, and that will be used to pay for our schools, social services and housing. Then the third largest section here is called climate change. The Welsh Government say they're investing nearly £3 billion there in grey in new buildings and our public transport network, all in a bid to make Wales net zero by 2050. Well, those are some of the details. Our correspondent Daniel Davis is at the Senedd for us this evening and can tell us more, Dan. Nick, inflation has taken a chunk out of that budget, so the Welsh Government has had to shuffle things around. It's dipped into its rainy day fund to try and resolve the strikes in the NHS. Plaid Cymru says if money is tight, well, one solution could be to raise income tax. And the Finance Minister, Rebecca Evans, says she thought about it, but a tax hike on higher earners, well, that wouldn't raise enough money. You'd have to put up the basic rate of income tax as well, she says, and that means the burden would fall on the shoulders of people who earn the least. The largest contribution would have to come from the basic rate band taxpayers and let's be clear that this would impact the lowest paid workers in Wales. And these are the same workers who are seeking help from food banks, the same workers who are having to choose between heating their homes and feeding their families. The use of Welsh rates of income tax should be considered and strategic. Ply Cymru put down an amendment in the draft budget debate calling for those tax rises and their leader, Adam Price, said that Labour and the Conservatives weren't being honest about the scale of the challenge and the amount of money needed. The combination of the pandemic and the cost of living crisis plus 12 years of austerity mean that the entire health and care system now is buckling, yeah. is buckling. And, and unless we do something radical, it is going to collapse. Now, the Conservatives say the Welsh Government has enough money to spend. It should concentrate on practical solutions to speed up treatment in the NHS and give up on other projects like expanding the size of the Senedd. For the Government that has called this very budget a budget for hard times, it doesn't seem as if Ministers are solely focused on these hard times, does it? To put simply, Llywydd, we need a plan that focuses on the immediate problems faced by the people and businesses of Wales. Now, the budget got through without that Plaid Cymru amendment on tax rises, but during the course of the debate, we heard a bit of disquiet on the Labour backbenches as well. One Labour member uh, said that the cooperation deal between Labour and Plaid Cymru to get the budget through was failing. Another one listed a whole host of concerns about Welsh Government spending commitments, echoing some pretty damning criticism we heard in a report from the Finance Committee here last night, which said that this government budget doesn't do enough to stop people falling into hardship during the cost of living crisis, Nick. OK, Dan, thank you very much for that. Still to come before seven. I hopes for 5,000 Wrexham fans tonight heading to Sheffield United in the FA Cup. Victory would give them a home tie against Tottenham Hotspur. It'd be tougher because I think we had a better chance at our place because um, the home advantage, obviously, but we've got 5,000, so I think... Should be uh, an even match.
It's been called a transformational change and the first ever made-to-measure Welsh farming legislation. The Agriculture Bill is being debated at the Senedd tonight also. Environmental groups say it's not going far enough, while farming unions are more worried about the funding for the current environmental schemes. Our environment correspondent, Teleri Glyn-Jones, has been to a cooperative farm near Carnarvon to find out more. Tuthin Teg is a farm with a purpose, to grow vegetables sustainably in balance with nature and feed the people on its doorstep. Through the farm shop, Tuthin Teg supplies 170 veg boxes locally every week. Agle Bindi is one of the 12 members of the co-op. She hadn't worked in farming before, but especially after becoming a mother, she says choosing this way of life was a necessity. I always felt in anything else I was doing that there was a big cognitive dissonance with, with, with who I was, what I was aspiring to, where the world was going and what, what I was allowed to answer. Um, and I felt like the few projects where I could take ownership of a, uh, my future and, and the world's future and my family's future. The Welsh Government want to see more community food schemes like this, linking local people directly with local food. It's one part of the far-reaching agriculture bill which is today being debated in the Senedd. The Welsh Government says it's transformational and aims to support sustainable food production and to conserve and enhance the Welsh countryside. But environmental charity WWF Cymru want them to go further. Historically, the Welsh Government has been rather hesitant around the notions of restoration. It instead refers terms like maintenance and enhance, which are obviously much, much weaker. You know, I can polish a dent in my car all day and enhance it, but I'm not going to restore the dent just by doing that. Farmers are often presented as being at odds with environmental groups, but on Rhodri Jones's traditional upland farm near Llanuchlin in Gwynedd, farming and habitat go hand in hand. We laid that and put new fencing in. It's gone nice and dense which gives the lambs good shelter, which is something that's very sparse here, um, as well as giving songbirds uh, nesting ground. NFU Cymru are concerned that the payments that have supported this kind of work on Rhodri's farm are coming to an end. The Glastiff scheme is funded until the end of this year, but the new post-Brexit policy isn't due to start until April 2025, leaving a year-long funding vacuum. When you've had a grazing agreement or an environmental scheme for 30 years, to have the insecurity within 12 months that there may not be any support payment um, brings into a question what happens for that 12 months. Do you forget everything you've done for the last quarter of a century and go back to chase payments some other way, like increasing the number of stock? The Welsh Government says it's considering its options and stability payments will continue throughout this Senedd term and beyond. But farmers like Rhodri say they need more reassurance to continue protecting this landscape. Making it simpler for someone to legally change their gender is part of new proposals being unveiled by the Welsh Government. The LGBTQ plus action plan for Wales aims to improve the rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans and queer people in Wales. But similar proposals have caused huge controversy in Scotland and some are concerned that the issue could become a political football. More from our community's correspondent, Liz Clements. Looking through the history of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans and queer plus movement, from protest banners to campaign badges and to mark the launch of the LGBTQ plus action plan for Wales, the plan by the Welsh Government aims to help Wales reach its goal of becoming the most friendly nation in Europe to the LGBTQ plus community. It's not a plan that's been made and there's a piece of paper that's going to be put on a shelf. It really is about those outcomes for the LGBTQ plus community and we'll be held to account for that. It's a political priority for the Welsh Government and for me, but it's personal too because it's about creating the Wales that you know I want to see the Wales I would have liked to grow up in. Among over 40 actions is asking to have the powers to let Welsh people change their gender more easily. I myself, I'm non-binary, uh, gender fluid, I identify as both male and female. So I, I would relish the opportunity to have that, you know, officialised in some kind of way. A move by the Scottish Government who passed a gender recognition bill in their devolved parliament was blocked by the UK government last month, amid criticism from campaigners that allowing anyone to self-identify could impact on women's rights, such as in women-only spaces and services. Here in Wales, some campaigners have raised similar concerns about safety. They clearly intend to make Wales a very unfriendly place for women and girls. But we've been ignored 
our concerns have been dismissed as invalid, you know, similar pattern to what we've seen happening in Scotland. The action plan more broadly details steps ranging from more inclusive education, improving safety and breaking down barriers when it comes to healthcare. These were some of the views in Aberystwyth and Cardiff. It's awful to say, but I haven't really given it much thought. That makes me very happy. I think there could be more being done, but yeah. It makes me feel a lot more recognised. It's nice to know that there's someone looking out for me. Elements of the action plan, which was created in collaboration with Plaid Cymru, have been criticised by the Welsh Conservatives, who said the LGBTQ community deserve respect, support and understanding, but shouldn't be used as a political tool to secure more powers. One LGBTQ plus charity says the plan is only the first step. What I'm really keen for is for people not to become complacent by this. Um, an action plan um, is great and there's some really key and clear commitments as part of it, but we want to see it implemented. We want to see the lives of people here in Welsh change and change for the better. While some aspects of the action plan remain controversial, many members of the LGBTQ plus community welcome plans which aim to improve their rights. Some sports news now and the Wales midfielder Joe Allen has retired from international football. The 32-year-old played 74 times for Wales, helping them qualify for three major tournaments, of course. Our reporter Chris Wathen uh, is with me now. So, Chris, were you expecting this? Something of a surprise, certainly when you compare it to Gareth Bale and his decision to retire from all forms of football last month and all the speculation that went into that. So it's come as a shock to fans. It's even come as a shock to some officials at the Football Association of Wales, but make no doubt about this. This is something that Joe Allen would have thought about for a long time, certainly since the World Cup, where he had injuries, if you remember, going into the tournament and after the tournament. He missed Swansea's game against Birmingham at the weekend. And it's quite telling that in his statement, he says, unfortunately, time and injuries take their toll and it's time to stand aside for the next generation. That's something Rob Page has to consider now. The European qualifiers start next month against Croatia, a future without Gareth Bale and now at Joe Allen. And he's been right in the middle of things, hasn't he, for this amazing period for Welsh football. How do we assess his legacy? Put it like this, when Joe Allen made his debut in 2009 against Estonia, there were 3,000 fans there to watch it. 74 caps, three major finals, central to each and every one of them. Team of the tournament when Wales made the semi-finals in Euro 2016. That's why he's regarded as one of Wales' greatest midfielders. Not quite the same stardust as Bale and Aaron Ramsey, but just as influential and just as appreciated. Gareth Bale summed it up when he was asked, why does Joe Allen not make the headlines as much? He said, he does in this squad. It's a squad now that looked very different without Joe Allen. Indeed. OK, Chris, thanks very much for that. Wrexham are in FA Cup action tonight, facing Sheffield United in a replay of their fourth round tie. The thrilling first game ended in a three-all draw, so there's plenty to look forward to for the thousands of Wrexham fans heading to Yorkshire tonight. Sean Pennar caught up with some of them before they set off. With the race course rocking, Wrexham put on a real show when Sheffield United came to town a little over a week ago. Leading 3-2 with minutes to go, a momentous upset was on the cards until the visitors' captain intervened deep into injury time. The tie then will be settled tonight in Sheffield. Around 5,000 Wrexham fans are making the journey to Yorkshire where the Reds will go toe-to-toe -to -toe again with a team three divisions above them. Nervous, to be honest with you. Yeah, it'll be tougher because I think we've got a better chance at our place because um, the home advantage, obviously. What's it going to take to make you feel like a home match tonight? All the crowd getting behind them, isn't it? Definitely, yeah. Hopefully drown the Sheffield United fans out. That's our aim. So my husband and I are actually in town for our 15th wedding anniversary. Uh, we were in London and this is he, he loves following the club, so we came up here for a, the match. <laughs> oh, excited, excited, hoping to get on the right bus. We we actually got the wrong bus tickets. She's got one and I've got Different another. Bus, yep. I didn't plan it that way, but um, yeah, trying to get on and go. Excited. Both Wrexham and Sheffield United are second in their respective divisions and gaining promotion in the league is a priority for both teams. But there's a big prize for the winners of tonight's FA Cup replay, a home tie against Tottenham Hotspur. Everybody knows the prize at stake here of what, of what we've got to, to overcome first and then potentially have the, the chance of playing against. Uh, a real, real top premiership side with top players, top manager and 
again, another, another good test for whoever gets through. Former Swansea striker Ollie McBurney scored for the visitors first time round. He's hoping for less drama at Bramall Lane tonight. You know, over 90 minutes anything could happen. You know, the atmosphere was unbelievable, fair play. You know, it was a it was a good part, it was a good game to be involved in. The fans made it made it um made it a good atmosphere. And like I say, it was it was a lot more fun for the for the fan, for the neutrals to watch, I guess, than it was for us to play in. But hopefully we can uh, make it as a, a lot less eventful tomorrow night. But the excitement doesn't seem to stop when Wrexham are involved. Be ready for plenty more tonight. And fingers crossed for Wrexham, of course, and you can listen to the full commentary of that match on BBC Radio Wales Sport. Right, let's get the weather. Derek is here. How's it looking? Quiet and settled at the moment, Nick, thanks to high pressure. And there's more dry weather to come over the next few days with only a little rain or drizzle in the forecast. Now, it was a cold start for many of us this morning with sunshine and frost in Ponta Preeth. We've also had some fog patches too, foggy in Nantmel in Powys this morning. And some stripy clouds appeared across most of the country this afternoon. These clouds are called alto cumulus, around 15 to 18,000 feet. Now, most of the cloud will clear this evening, leaving clear skies overnight. And that means another cold night ahead. A few fog patches forming too. Lowest temperatures around minus three Celsius, a few spots colder than that. So another widespread frost, but staying above freezing on Anglesey. Now, tomorrow, high pressure will be centred over Eastern Europe. Notice this cold front that is heading our way. So a cold and frosty start for many of us again tomorrow morning. Watch out for these fog patches too. They could be dense and freezing in places and slow to lift and clear. Otherwise, a fine day for many of us tomorrow. More sunshine, but some cloud will edge in from the west later in the afternoon. The wind picking up as well, becoming fresh to strong in the northwest. The top temperature around 9 Celsius, but a chilly 4 Celsius in Brecon. Now, tomorrow night, that cold front will arrive, spreading its way southeastwards, bringing a little rain and drizzle. A dry end to the night in the north, clearer too, with a touch of frost there. Thursday looks a decent day, dry with bright skies and sunny spells, temperatures reaching around average for February. That's around 5 to 9 Celsius. And then on Friday, more dry weather, some sunshine but cloud increasing, maybe some drizzle in Dolgetli, the temperature up to 11 Celsius in Pembroke. It's not looking too bad for the weekend, mostly dry and settled. Some low cloud and mist, but hopefully more in the way of sunshine on Sunday. Nick. Let's hope, Derek. Thank you. That's where it's today. I'll be back after the 10 o'clock news. Hope to see you then. Have a good evening.